Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Ebune, Ed from Le Pont de Jots here in Douala, the New York of Cameroon. Plus two years. That is the number of time we have spent collectively across the world to see and to secure the release of over plus 200 and 50 Nigerian schoolgirls kidnapped in the community of Chibok. The global community has been providing assistance in varied forms to make sure that the girls are back in the classroom, at least with their parents to see them. Some of their parents are of late, and civil society organizations, communities, governments, and other world wishers across the world have been joining their efforts to secure the release of the girls. That in itself provides a unique opportunity to question the place of the girl child in the 21st century where terrorism is increasingly using them as effective suicide bombers. So what do we do to roll back such a situation? My guest today is one of Cameroon's female activists who has been involved in the business for the past 20 years and she equally heads Cameroon's People Party based here in Douala, the littoral region of Cameroon. How does a girl child want to be identified and defined in the 21st century in that atmosphere of terrorism? My guest, Edith Kawala. Edith Kabanwala, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. First, are you subscribed to the ideology that what a man can do, a woman can do it better? I think the, the world that we want to create is a world where men and women have equal opportunity to do uh, whatever the, their talents enable them to do. Um, men and women have different talents. There's a diversity amongst men, there's a diversity amongst women. We don't all want to do the same things. We are not all capable of doing the same things. I think what is important in our world is that every young girl and every young boy should have the opportunity to develop their food. So you don't belong to that feminist branch, which of course has been increasingly becoming important across the world, which calls, and I repeat the assertion that what a man can do, a woman can do it better. You, are, you, you seem not to be part of it. No, I'm not. I don't think that uh, one group of people is, is automatically best, uh, better than the other because of, of biology, not at all. I think what we want is a world where when we have women having access to decision making, Having, we have women who are at the heads of countries, we have women who are at the heads of parliaments, we have women who are at the heads of companies, to the same degree that we have men, then we have a better world. I think uh, I am part of that group of people. I don't want to replace men with women and have an imbalance in the society. I want to have a balanced society where we have men and women together building our you, you, you know some newspapers, some analysts, some politicians across the world today believe that, okay, since women say that what a man can do, they can do it better. And that gives a very worrying definition of uh, the description of female suicide bombers today. Okay, since women can be bet better murderers, that is why they are increasingly being used by terrorist organizations to carry out uh, attacks across nations. How do you interpret that across the world? Are you worried of the fact that so many girls are being used as female suicide bombers today? I think first of all, let us not get confused. Terrorist organizations are still overwhelmingly male organizations. The number of women uh, being used as terrorists, as uh, suicide bombers, yes, it is on the increase. But uh, for the most part, whether you are looking at Boko Haram or Al Qaeda or um, uh, uh, Daesh, these are these are male organizations run by men. Now, uh, the women we feel, especially when we look at Boko Haram, 
that these are victims. These are women who have been kidnapped. And this is the story that the women are telling. They have been kidnapped, they have been brainwashed, and many of them go in as a suicide bomber under threat of their own life. So they are told either you bomb or you will be killed. So, um, so far we have seen on rare case, uh, occasions, I think there is one woman who was part of Daesh and was part of the strategic, uh, at the strategic level. But for the most part, these are young girls, young women who are victims. Female suicide bombers are the best experts in mass killing. Why? Uh, first of all, I doubt that. <laughs> I honestly doubt that. Uh, when well, you, you, you simply need to go to Nigeria and know what is happening in Maiduguri. You simply need to go to, to, to Palmyra in, in Syria and know what is happening. You simply need to go to the far north region of the country, of Cameroon. And you know that if they are talking of uh, a suicide bomb in Amshidi, which kills 130 people, for example, you can always say that, okay, that was a suicide bomb attack carried by a woman because it effectively kills so many people. Why? I think, let us be clear, uh, young women are being used as suicide bombers. But as again, I, I affirm that terrorist organizations are male. If we had one suicide bomber kill 100 plus people, we have had over 1,000 people killed by Boko Haram, and the vast majority of them were killed by men. So, and I think that many of the men, many of the boys, because they are also very young men being used as soldiers within these terrorist organizations, I think they are also victims for the most part. You know, um, at the level of the CPP in 2013, we wrote an open letter to the head of state of Cameroon, 2013, November 2013, and said to him, we have a problem in the extreme north of our country. There is there are extreme, extremist groups which are recruiting our young people. Now, we have to look at terrorism and what creates fertile ground for terrorists to recruit. Terrorists recruit in places where youth do not have jobs, they are not going to school, they do not have hope, they are in very desperate economic conditions. That is fertile ground for every type of terrorist group to come in and recruit either young men or young women. The other thing that terrorist groups do is kidnapping. As we see, uh, the Chibok girls that you, you mentioned earlier, but I think that the Chibok girls only allow us to understand, uh, only at, you know, brought to the world in a very shocking manner, the fact that Boko Haram was kidnapping young people. But if you go to the extreme north of Cameroon, you will find families who will tell you their children have been kidnapped, their young men, their young women have been kidnapped by Boko Haram. But, uh, so uh, this terrorism uh, is a problem uh, uh, these young people uh, Kawala, can I inject something? You said that Boko Haram or terrorist organizations recruit in fetal areas yes. considered to be poor areas where there is extreme poverty, where people don't have opportunities to go to school, where uh, there is extreme hardship. Some scientists or educated people would tell you that that argument is an extremely weak economic argument for terrorists because if you go to a country like Belgium, the French ambassador to Cameroon, Christine Robichon, told me in this program that you have plus 1,000 French nationals who are fighting for Daesh, the Islamic State. If you look at those who carried the attacks in Belgium, those who did it in the UK, those who did it in France, these are extremely rich countries in Germany where you have all opportunities you can imagine, but you have plus 27,000 young people from Europe, especially from European capitals, with the best opportunities on earth, joining Daesh in poor Iraq and poor Syria. The economic argument of lack of opportunities in maybe uh, Chibok, maybe in Ashigashia or Kolofata seems useless in explanation. No, not at all. I think that where terrorism is concerned, people are being recruited for different reasons. Uh, there is no question about it that in northern Nigeria, in northern Cameroon, I happen to have visited the extreme north. I think I was the first national leader 
to go on the ground after the cold fat attacks and talk to the population. But you know that and Osama bin Laden, you know that Osama population. bin Laden was from a billionaire family. Of course, he, he's at the top. You know that Abu Bakr Shekau is not a poor guy. And these guys are the leaders, but they are not the recruits. The recruits are being recruited in poor areas for the large part. Even in Europe, when you look at the profile of those who are recruited in Europe, they come from the poorest levels of the society, they are marginalized, they are young people who believe that they do not have is that Is that the case with Mohammed Mira? Is that the case society? with... Uh, Salah Abdeslam, is that the case with Lakrawi, Bakrawi? These are people from Belgium, in the center of the but European who, capital. Who, who are they in Belgium? What neighborhood are they living in in Belgium? But that, How do they assess themselves? That, but that, that, is a that, young, that is a young man who is simply living next to the headquarters of the European Union. That does not mean that he does not feel he's poor. I'm sorry, if you go to Etudi in Yaoundé, there are people living right next door to Etudi who are in abject poverty. So it is the fact of creating large groups of people in societies, whether it is Europe or whether it is us here in Africa, whenever you create a large group of people who are marginalized, who feel like in this society we do not have hope, in this society we are not able to succeed, in this society there is injustice towards us, whenever you create those conditions, you create the conditions for recruitment. Now, the vast majority of the population in those conditions will not be recruited. It is still a very small minority that is recruited. But as countries today, whether we are talking about Cameroon, whether we are talking about Nigeria, or we are talking about Belgium, or the United States, we as states have to ask ourselves, what are the states doing to create the conditions where a young person knows they are going to die because we'll, many of these we'll, young people we'll, know they're going to we'll, die we'll talk and that, they take that option. We'll talk that in a moment. Let me rewind the interview and go back to the girl child. When we stayed two years without seeing the Chibok girls, with all the campaigns bring back our girls headed by former uh, World Bank Vice President for Africa, former Nigerian Minister for Solid Minerals, um, uh, Catherine Obiageli Ezekwisili, and some of you met the Nigerian High Commissioner to Cameroon, Adisa Mustafa. When we stayed two years without seeing 276 girls, does that give you any hope of having a girl child? Of course it does. I don't think that um, I know Obi Ezekwisili very well. She's a friend of mine. I am extremely proud of her for the work that she has done in terms of bringing back uh, uh, the Bring Back Our Girls campaign to constantly remind the Nigerian government about these girls. Now, I do not think personally that there are 276 girls sitting somewhere in a group. I think the way terrorist organizations function that they split up those girls a very long time ago, almost immediately after they were kidnapped, and that the girls have been sent to various locations, and that it's going to be quite a challenge. We had this situation in- Do you Canada. have any sense of fear as a woman that in the 21st century, the life of a girl child is extremely in danger? Because 276 girls not seen for plus two years, with all the drones, the technologies we have, it is a very, very worrisome issue. I think that, I, I, I don't have fear. I think that while we have to take terrorism seriously, while we have to take the kidnapping of the girls seriously, uh, these are 276 girls versus the hundreds of millions of young girls in the world who are living very, very fruitful lives. I think that we have to take seriously the fact that girls are now being used as a tool for terrorists. We have known for a long time that terrorist organizations capture girls as girl brides, um, that they use these girls for manpower because these guys are going to war, they're going to, to, to carry out their operations. They need people who will cook and who will clean and who will uh, maintain uh, uh, life for them. 
so and and it is worrying because we see more and more groups of armed girls even in organizations like Daesh. But um, I think this should not mean that we become afraid for every girl child in the world. Mm. I think that um, our, uh, we, we still have a lot of challenges for girl children in mm. terms of education, in terms of them having equal opportunity, in terms of them not being victims of early marriage. Believe you me, early, early marriage in Cameroon is affecting more than 276 girls every year mm. who are going into marriage at 12, at 13, mm. much younger than they, they what, should what, 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 what So is, I think there are a lot of challenges for the girl child. We should focus on all of those challenges, but uh, I think this world of ours today is a wonderful place to be a woman. It's a wonderful place to be a girl. Uh, let's not uh, make it seem as if every girl is going to be kidnapped. Well, you can say that because most people see you as a successful woman and that, okay, if we don't see the 276 girls, okay, there are other challenges we need to focus. But you know media and journalism in particular is that when there are 100 trains and 99 arrive on time. I am interested in the one that does not arrive on time because that is where the problem is. And what I want to know from you, you said a while ago that you, back in 2013, wrote a letter to the President of the Republic of Cameroon. Uh, I just want to inquire about the contents of the letter, what you were proposing as policy solutions to extremism. Uh, exactly. So this letter was an open letter. Because probably the time for blame game is over. Now everybody is about looking solutions. I think nobody is trying to blame anybody. In fact, in 2013, we didn't blame anybody. We proposed solutions. Mm. And at the time, 2013, I remind that the president only declared this war in May 2014. So more than six months after. In 2013, we suggested to him already that he needed to be the leader of a regional approach to fighting against this terrorism. And which he has done. We suggested to him that he call a summit and bring together the other heads of state so that we could have a regional approach. We're happy that he did it. We think if he had done it in November 2013, we would not be where we are today. Now, um, the other element was that we, and we still, till today, the CPP has about 11 communications to government suggesting that we have an integrated approach to fighting terrorism. The security and military approach is very important, very necessary. But the economic, the strategy for economic development in the regions that are most affected by ter terrorism leaves a lot to be desired. The social approach, Today, we have 150,000 internally displaced people, internally displaced Cameroonians, due to the attacks in the extreme north. Most of them are women and girls. That means people who do not have homes, people who, their, their children who were going to school, now they have to find if, if, if I may understand you, so If I may understand you well, for the, for, for, for the sake of ordinary understanding, you seem to say that we need a kind of George Bush approach which said terrorism is the war of the mind. We need to win the mind. I think that it's more than the mind. In our case, we need to put into place the social and economic conditions which give our children and our young people... A comprehensive hope. educational we program, need, you mean to say? We, we need to have proper schools in the extreme north. If we have a problem of not having water here in the south, believe you me, in the extreme north, you have very tragic images of women digging the sand to try to find water. But you, to give water you, 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 to without, without, without so cutting you, with, you without, don't have with, water, without cutting you. Now let me finish. If you don't have water as a young person, you are 18 years old, you find that your state cannot provide you with water to, to drink. They cannot provide you with a proper school for you to go to school. There is definitely no hope for a job because you're, you see your older brothers and sisters who have finished school and have not been able to get a job. Then some funny story that somebody is telling you about religion and about uh, uh, injustice and so on becomes attractive to you. If you are a young person going to school, looking at a life of hope, you, 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 looking you, you, at you, you, a future you, 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 you are not tempted by are you aware of the conspiracy theory that 
Boko Haram in particular is a creation of opposition to unseat those in power. You are part of the opposition. Are you aware of that conspiracy theory? And you have, probably you have read it across the media. I find that theory completely amusing. That it's what you guys failed to get through the ballot box, you have decided to get it the other way around. I, f I find that story, Do you find yourself guilty? I find that story completely amusing. I think only a child would uh, even entertain such a notion for even 30 seconds. One, power, the seat of power as far as power concerns Cameroon is in Yaoundé. No mad person will want to take over power in Cameroon and go and start at the furthest point from Yaoundé to start in, in, in Marwa, number one. Number two is that if you want to take over power, let us say that Boko Haram was a group that wanted to take over power in Cameroon, they would then be conquering territory and moving towards Yaoundé. These people came right into Kolfata. Kolfata is 600 kilometers from the border. They came, they carried out an action, and without our forces of law and order bothering them, they went right back to where they came from. Let me narrow the discussion to you personally. How do you feel about your activities, plus 15 years of experience in leadership, teaching, and activism? 25. 25. That is why I said plus 15 years, because I don't have the exact <laughs> figures. 10, 10, 10, 10 is important. Okay. 25. Plus okay. 25. Okay. Do you think you are an achieved woman? I think that um, I get invited around the world to speak as a leader, to speak as an entrepreneur, to speak as somebody who is bringing about change. So the, the plane trips are a success to you? No. I don't think I speak in the plane. I, I, I get invited to speak. A plane is just a means to get there. Now, um, and I've been in plane since I was about 11 years old. I don't think it's a, that is impressing me. So uh, actually, if we go to uh, the way the world measures success, Yes, I think I would be considered as a leader and as a successful person. For me personally, I am not okay. I am not okay because two nights ago, I slept without electricity. In Douala, where it is 32 degrees at night in this season, it's a very, very difficult sleep when you don't have a fan or an air conditioner. I have, I am not happy because when I turn on my faucet in the morning, I'm not sure whether I will have water. This is unacceptable to me as a Cameroonian and as an African in 2016. So I do not feel a, a accomplished. I will feel accomplished the day that my country, Cameroon, is actually living up to its potential, giving its young people opportunity, being one of the most powerful economies, not only on this continent, but in the world. We have everything to deliver that, and where we are not talking about water and electricity. It's not part of our con conversation because it is a given that every citizen has that. So those are the things that will make me feel Kawala. I do not want a Monique Kawala. to take another one. Kawala. I want these are people, to these are people, these, these, well are pe these are people you have trained their local leaders. When you say those who are governing you, these are people you have equally trained their local leaders. Over 5,000 of them over the 10 years. This is information available on your official website. And there is a belief in educational sciences that when you have 10 candidates in an exam as a teacher and nine of them fail one pass, the teacher is equally a failure. You are part of the failure. Absolutely not. Uh, one is that we're not talking about students in an exam. We're talking about males who attended one seminar. That one seminar does not determine their success or failure as a male. Final thought. Um, somebody wrote online before I came to interview for me to put this question to you that you only make noise when elections are around. Why that choice? I think that question, first of all, the person who asked it is a person who is not doing their homework. And I assume if you are transmitting it, then I wonder whether you are doing your homework. 
because the CPP is one of the parties that is constantly on the field in the last, the last election was in 2011. Since 2011, we have worked on the case of stolen children. We have worked on the case of people whose homes are being broken by the state. We have worked on the case of young people and employment. We have worked on so many cases, healthcare in Cameroon. We are one of the rare parties that is constantly on the ground, constantly meeting Cameroonians, even carrying out pilot projects to see how we can solve our problems as a nation. So we don't have that problem of waiting for elections. Edith Kawala, I'm afraid we have to end here. Thank you very much indeed for being guest on Globe Watch. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Okay.